Uh, afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining. Um, yeah, this is uh, eighth, number eight now, and this one's especially around uh, REM and you know, the possibilities of REM. Uh, we've got, um, well, we, we did have five uh, talks lined up, but we got commas issues with, uh, with two of them. Um, so we've got three great speakers at the moment lined up, and if Andrew Ledley can join us while, we're at, while he's at sea, um, he will be joining us uh, within the lineup as well. Um, so we haven't got a lot of time. I know it seems like an hour and a half, but um, you know, by the time we've done the presentations and then get through to some questions, I'm sure the time's going to fly. Um, so we're going to have um, speakers, and they're going to talk for a bit, between five and seven minutes. Um, and then we're going to do part two of the session after the speakers. We're going to go um, into sort of a QA and a um, sort of questions, but we're going to keep the questions quite short. Uh, and you know, if you want to ask a question to a particular person, you know, please mention. Uh, at that point, um, we'll tell you who the lineup is in the um, in the Q and A session. So I was going to make a start, and um, first up, we've got Wes Erickson, who's uh, kindly joined us from Vancouver uh, in British Columbia, and um, he's going to he's going to give us a talk about his experience with Ren. So if it's okay for you, over to you, Ren. Uh, over to you, Wes. All right. Can everyone hear me? Okay. David, you yeah, okay? okay fine, Wes, thank you. All right. So um, thank you for allowing me to attend and, and, uh, and speak. I uh, always enjoy uh, connecting with uh, other people in the industry, especially, uh, especially us. The UK, I love that part of the world. So um, um, anybody who knows me knows I'm a fourth gener generation commercial fisherman. I grew up commercial fishing. I'm primarily a halibut fisherman. And this is a story about my favorite fish, halibut. So I'm gonna go way back to the 1940s when trawl was no longer allowed to retain halibut on the Pacific coast in Canada and the United States because around 90% of the trawl catch was sublegal when a size limit was implemented. But the mortality remained an ongoing real concern, especially for the halibut sector. So finally in 1991, Canada and the United States agreed to a target for halibut bycatch mortality reduction. Uh, Canada had little success achieving halibut bycatch reductions until uh, 1996 when the trawl fishery was closed until the participants could develop a plan to account for discards and honor the bilateral agreement of 1991. At the same time, there'd been some really bad press for the trawl sector, allegations of massive at sea discards. With the fishery closed, the participants were incentivized to come up with a management plan quickly that addressed the concerns. This new plan included implementation of 100% at sea observation and individual allocations of all species, including halibut, as a non retained bycatch. Canadian West Coast trawlers became a model of best practices. It was like magic. No more at sea discards that were, no, that were not accounted for. Halibut mortality dropped from 2 million to 200,000 pounds in one year. Full accountability and monitoring. Um, was just part of the deal. Um, trawl was just one of seven gear types that all shared in a common ground fish TAC. The rest of the sectors to, were to remain anonymous to the environmental community and not be affected by international agreements. So we could cap out on all our allowable catch by discarding our overages. This lasted until about 1999 when we were noticed. You see, this is the west coast of Canada. Um, ENGOs, environmental groups, are conceived, gestate, and are born here. Greenpeace is just one example. So it became a problem, unreported catch, and in almost all fisheries, many species are encountered. Closed areas and discarded catch are difficult to monitor. The next step in our evolution was integration. So we needed to prove ourselves sustainable. We needed to integrate the various fisheries and level the playing field. So how do we address this problem? We design a process. Seven fishing sectors participated in this process. Now, right about this same time, um, my marriage was falling apart. And anytime I wasn't fishing, the last place I wanted to be was at home. So I put my name forward to be a halibut representative in this industry process. It was thought to be an exercise in futility. One seasoned veteran of advisory processes thought it would be like watching paint dry. Um, so I wasn't asked because of my extraordinary qualifications, more likely it was because no one else wanted to do it. So we met for two to three days every month for a year. 
Now, I would just assume that I had the maturity to collaborate and problem solve with a group of my peers. The problem is I can't objectively see myself. I'm a self-centered egomaniac with an inferiority complex, and so are many of my peers. So we accomplished absolutely nothing. Um, then we reported our lack of progress to the Department of Fisheries and Oceans and expected them to say, well, you gave it a good try, lads. Business as usual. Instead, uh, they issued us an ultimatum. They said, they said, figure it out. Figure it out or we're going to figure it out for you. So we were motivated, but we didn't know how to make progress. We, we hated each other and trust just wasn't part of any equation. One of the members, not me, I couldn't see past my own self-interest, uh, thought it might be a good idea to use an independent professional facilitator. That turned out to be crucial and pivotal because um, communication is really important. <laughs> he helped us create a mission statement, develop a guiding principles, which became our rules of engagement. Then we began to negotiate, eventually determined how to share fish and make our fishery defensible. Mostly we were addressing all our collective fears. This was a point we realized that uh, EM or REM as you guys call it would be the only option for our smaller vessels. We envisioned the technology we would need to meet our objectives then worked over the next three years with a monitoring company to develop the equipment. As this was going on, the process continued. We began to realize that a fully monitored fleet would eliminate the question of trust from the equation. This would allow the industry to communicate with scientists and managers and each other like never before. So 2006, we implemented. Many thought it would fail. Some set out to ensure that it would fail. It worked surprisingly well because we were collectively all involved in its design. So the logbooks are now audited against the video footage and compared to the offloads. At sea data provides information on total catch mortality. All seven fisheries, all with various catches, combined over 70 species and became fully accountable. Each vessel is individually accountable for all catch, whether retained or released. And there's trading of quotas between vessels, gear types, and fisheries with 100% dockside and at sea monitoring. Now, we didn't set out to put cameras on every vessel. We set out to put together a plan to keep fishing. Monitoring became part of that plan as we worked towards achieving a set of objectives. Monitoring on its own would just be costly and burdensome, but as an important component of our newly integrated fishery, it was crucial. Full accountability and monitoring are now accepted as the new reality. We think of it as paying for insurance and with it, our fishery is defensible. So now I've just summed up 50 plus years of fishing in, over, in under seven minutes. So as you can imagine, there's a lot more to the story. Um, so feel free to reach out at any time uh, during, after, or any time with any questions you might have. And I hope you found something useful in this story. Thanks for your time. That's an incredible um, incredible reflection of a co-management journey there. And God, amazing what you did, uh, all of you. Um, so uh, we're going to have a chance to speak to Wes um, at the end of the Q&A, like I said. So I'm going to move on to Mark Hagar. Uh, Mark works for the New England Marine Monitoring in the USA. And he works very closely with fishermen um, and he makes sure that the legal considerations, the data topics, program design, and uh, make sure that, you know, it really, realistically that REM works aboard fishing vessels in, in North America or in the USA. So um, over to you, Mark. If that's it. All right. Thank you, David. Can everyone hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Great. Um, so jumping across North America, I'm coming to you from New Bedford, Massachusetts. Um, and once again, Mark Hager, um, I run New England Marine Monitoring. Uh, full disclosure, we are an electronic or an REM uh, company. That's really, I'm not here to talk about technology today. Uh, what I want to relay is some of my lessons learned from developing REM programs with groups of fishermen, voluntary REM programs with fishermen participation, and some of the lessons I've learned with those fishermen along the way. Um, I'm confident that REM can collect really good data and it can do it very cost effectively, um, but it's not always super easy to roll out a program and it's not always very quick either. So I have a, a couple of kind of uh, maybe warnings and then a couple of uh, lessons learned that I wanna run through. Um, the first one from my experience is, is you really have to define your objectives uh, right out front um, and they gotta be very clear and sticking to them is important. And if you have to pivot from them, 
it's important, I think, to take a step back and think about what that means for where you started. Um, I've, I've been involved in several programs where something called scope creep has occurred and we started out with one objective. And by the time we ended, we had three or four other objectives that have been slid in. Um, and that can really kind of um, screw up the process. So I think it's really important to stick to your objectives and be clear and reevaluate if necessary. Um, second, um, I think thinking big is really important. Uh, it's very helpful when you're thinking about how REM can plug into a fishery um, or management practice to think about what already exists there. And that's a really good place to start. Um, but sometimes that can actually be limiting. Um, and if you're not um, thinking about it as its own type of data collection, you can miss some of the opportunities. Um, and one thing I have found in, in almost every program I've worked on is you have to be a little careful in thinking about what the the um, existing data sets are and or maybe what the, the truth is. If you're trying to compare data collected with REM to data collected in some other manner, the data collected in that original manner might have biases already inherently baked into it. And it's just important to recognize that when you're comparing them, it might not be apples to apples. Um, from, from my perspective, one of the most important things is um, data ownership and, and data access. Um, for, the, for the folks on the water, for the fishing businesses, you know, pushing for data ownership, if that isn't possible because of regulations, um, really clear data access is, is absolutely key, I feel. Um, and then using that data for the, for the better betterment of your business. A um, couple examples that, that I've seen from, from my experiences, um, we have the US Coast Guard board a vessel. Um, he had some lobsters on board that had eggs on them, which isn't allowed in the United States. Um, he had, well, I think it was one lobster. He had a citation. Um, he was really upset because he had been checking all the lobsters all along. He had cameras overhead watching this. When he went into his citation meeting, he brought the video. He asked us for the video. He brought the video in and he said, look at this six hour period. I am checking every single lobster and I'm throwing ones over with eggs. It was rough seas. He was getting splashed in the face and one lobster happened to slip by. Um, and I believe the citation was dropped. So that was a good example of a guy using the cameras on his boats. They weren't for this purpose, but he was using them to Help, help support his business. Um, another one happened just last week. Um, in New England, we're facing a, a bit of a haddock crisis um, where what fishermen are catching on the water is not lining up with science. Everyone is probably pretty familiar with those, those kind of stories. Um, and we're looking at dramatic haddock cuts um, starting next Monday, but the fishermen are catching large, large bags of haddock um, and they're very worried about being able to avoid them. So at, the, at our most recent management meeting last week, Fishermen asked us for video. We provided them with video and they, they went to the video armed with, uh, they went to the meeting armed with video proof of, of the catches that they're catching. Um, and while it was anecdotal, it really did help paint the whole picture of, of the discrepancy between what the science was seeing, what the fishermen were seeing on the water. So that was just last week and it was a really good, really good example. Um, a little more focused towards kind of on the water. Um, this is a little specific, but I think it's important. Um, when designing a program, I think it's important to plan for your most complex catch composition. Um, sometimes you're designing a program and you're testing it out and it's in one season and everything's going great. And you think, let's lock these rules in and, and just run with it. But as the season shifts, maybe your species shift, maybe there's some more, some more flatfish species or some more small species in the mix and it causes problems or challenges um, documenting those with cameras or handling those uh, on deck. And it's just important to think about you know, it's pretty easy sometimes to solve a clean, clean catch uh, and use REM for that. But if the catch has different composition or some more bycatch in it, it's important to consider that ahead of time and not just plan for the, the optimal um, catch. Um, another another uh, issue is, or suggestion I would have, I guess, would be to consider some thresholds. Um, the, the most beneficial thing about using video for fisheries data collection is that you can rewind. The most harmful thing about using video for fisheries data collection is that you can rewind. Um, and I, I think what I'm trying to say is the fundamental use of video cameras to collect this data means that you can go back and look at stuff, which is a little bit different than most data collection that happens out of the water, observer data or dockside data. Once that record has been written down, you don't always have a chance to go review that and actually see verifiable proof of, of what that record was. Um, so that's a problem with that data. 
um, and the REM can solve because you can go back, but you have to be careful that you're, you're not going back too often for really small, maybe in, inconsequential things that can start to get very expensive. Um, I've seen programs where, you know, a, a hundred thousand pound or landing, uh, and we're looking at a, a one fish or two fish level um, issue, which, you know, when you look at the scale of that, maybe, maybe isn't completely appropriate. And is if you're going back for a line, that's going to cost somebody, whether it's whoever's putting the bill for it, um, money down the line. So I think it's important just to think about that. Um, and then um, lastly, um, I think this can save money. Uh, a lot of people talk about REM because they want to find uh, a cheaper alternative to um, a, a different type of monitoring. Um, and uh, I've been doing this now for about 10 years. For the first five years, I couldn't confidently say, say that it was going to ultimately save too much money, but we have seen in the last number of years, um, we can do this cheaper than we can put um, human observers out, out on the water. Uh, my company does, does both of those um, tasks. Um, we support those both fully. They both have their, their, their benefits. Um, but right now, uh, we're able to put cameras out and collect really similar data um, for a little bit less money. Um, and so when you're thinking about designing a program, I think cost is probably up front for everyone. A lot of people talk about what technology can do, uh, different types of technology, remote transmission, artificial intelligence. These are all super valuable, important things. They're what I've built a business around. So I don't want to understate that they are important, but before I think you even get to that point, the program design is the fundamentals of an electronic monitoring or an REM program. And you can get cost savings from day one without any technological investment. If you work as a group intelligently, actually do some, do some deep planning um, and collaborate and come up with a, a solid program design that's gonna work for everyone. Um, and with that, I will pass it to the next speaker. Thanks, Mark. Um, it's really interesting. You're actually solving sort of real time data problems. And you know, you're, you're also sort of saying, you know, be careful how you look back on the data, which is, you know, which is, yeah, it's critical. That, that's the fear factor as well as the benefit, isn't it? So, yeah, thanks so much, Marco. It's just fascinating. Um, what I'm going to try and do now is Andrew's uh, at sea. Um, so I'm going to do like a, a sort of interview, if I can, with Andrew and ask him a few questions of what he's up to and what he's involved with. So, Andrew, can you can you hear me? Can you still see him, Emma? Is he still on? He's still on. Andrew, you're just m muted. I'm asking you to unmute. We might not be able oh. up. Hi, Andrew. Can you hear me now? All right, David. Hi, Andrew. You all right? Yeah, uh, thanks for joining us, Andrew. I know you can see, so it'll be a little bit jumpy. Um, can you just, um, uh, Andrew's, Andrew's a skipper of the, of the success free, uh, 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 um, and he's fishing at the moment in the North Sea. Can you give us uh, just a, a little bit of a rundown of what you're involved with, Andrew, and what you're, you're presently involved in doing with, with the REM technology, please? Uh, we were involved originally with uh, discards and uh, counting the discards and estimating the discards uh, for departing at the uh, MMO. And I think now we're doing um, the way in uh, Gail's uh, trials with the cameras so they can recognise different species at different weights and they're estimating, uh, you know, the catches and stuff on that, and seeing if they tally with the scales. But we uh, we just have a technical problem with it at present. The part of it's not working at present, so they're just done with that and sorting it out. Oh, that's great. And Andrew, <clears throat> you got any sort of thoughts that you can sort of, you know, give people, you know, the, the benefits and the and and the and what we've got to be wary of from your perspective. You've worked with REM. Um, the benefits were, I would say, is what the previous speaker was saying. You get real time information to show what the catches are showing on the grounds. Instead of me just saying, oh, we're seeing loads of paddock, you know, it's there in, on video. So, and it's real time, and something could be done about it immediately instead of six months down the line, you know. And, uh, yeah. I mean, the other benefits also was uh, everything's 
from including their board to be going down the official discards and all trace of it. So there's no sort of uh, everybody knows what's happening aboard the vessel. Yeah. And um, what <clears throat> if you could say anything from you know, obviously the REM policy is going to be rolled out now by DEFRA. Um, is there anything that you say they must avoid doing? You know, what what, what would you warn against? Um, I don't, it's a difficult one, David. Uh, you know, you if you're all legal, then everything's above board. There was anything to worry about. The choke yeah. species might be a problem in certain areas, obviously. You know that yourself, uh, and there's always you know odd hall where you get a, you know something that you weren't expecting to get, and if you have a worry, what's going to happen then? Yeah, absolutely. Choke species is a big issue, and an enforcement level, I would have thought. I mean, that's one of my fears. Do, do you fear the sort of, you know, you, you, the overall the overall level is one thing, but you know, I do fear nitpicking. You know, uh, do, do you fear that? Do you... So, um, you know, so David, it's we have target species and we go after those target species. But I mean, I've been doing this for 35 years and I still get surprised sometimes by what comes up. So, what's going to happen to that odd haul where you do catch something that you're not targeting and you haven't got quota for it? What's yeah. going to be the policy on that? Yeah, so it's the you it's kind of expect the unexpected. We're living in a you know an ecological environment and it just changes. Was would that be how you you know sum that yeah. up? Or? Grounds change from day to day, don't they? Yeah, especially with the prawn fishing. You know, we can uh, go one day and just catch clean prawns, and next day might be a massive amount of haddock on the ground, and that yeah. would stop just catching the prawn because it floats our nets and we have to shift from that area, but we don't know until we actually haul. Yeah. And do you, did you find the cameras, did you find them intrusive at first and then you've got used to them, or how do you feel about it now? They never bothered me in the slightest, David. Not in, right. Didn't bother me in the slightest whatsoever. Yeah, that's good. That's good. No fears. <laughs> <laughs> You just forget about yeah. yeah, you do forget. Yeah. Well, Andrew, thanks very much for joining us. I know it's difficult for you to join today, but you know, I um, hope the fishing remains good. Um, and, uh, do we know. a dozen things at once here, so <laughs> yeah, <laughs> keep the boat on the toe. <laughs> thanks, Andrew. Yeah. Thanks so much for joining. No um, worries, man. Catch no, thank you. you. Cheers, Andrew. Um, so we're now going to move to Mike Park. Uh, Mike is um, Chief Executive of the Scottish Whitefish Association. Pretty much everyone knows Mike uh, on this call. So Mike, I'll just leave it leave it to you and um, your perspective on, uh, yeah. on what we're talking about. Thanks, there. David. Can can you hear me? Yes, can hear you loud clear, Mike. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. An interesting subject and one that's been discussed wide and far, I guess, with with varying uh, opinions over time. I mean, if you look at Scotland, we have a bit of a history with, with uh, well, CCTV, as it was called at that time, but now it's called REM. And way back in, I think it was 2000, 2006, 2007, uh, as, a, as a result of the Cod Recovery Plan and the, redu the reduction in days at sea, a number of our vessels started to put in cameras as a way out of that. I think at one point, our demersal fleet was reduced to 90 days at sea a year. And of course, we've got a number of larger vessels, medium to large vessels, who depend on significantly more days than that. And there was there was an allowance within the, the tech or the commission regulation, uh, which allowed vessels to opt out if they could prove they weren't catching cod. So a number of our vessels actually introduced cameras that time. And I think the latter year, there was 32 vessels had cameras on board. And I think the, 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 the point I'm trying to make is that you know, within their own heads as businessmen, because at the end of the day, fishermen are businessmen. It's just, you know, you can, you, can, you can lose money many times like any other business, but you run out of cash once. I mean, that's the basic principle. And they had the calculation in their head that am I better getting to sea and adopting my fishing practices 
or just going for 90 days and doing what I did. And they made the decision at that time, their call, their own commercial decision, that it was the right thing to do. The point there is that's monetization. There was a reward in it for them moving in that direction. And I think the principle going forward will have to remember that, that sort of uh, push and pull factor because without some differentiation, it'll be different to move in that direction. I think what we also need to remember is that in my mind, anyhow, and, and others may, may, may you know, dispute this position, but in my mind, that we need cameras because the fisheries management systems is poor and people are trying to introduce them in there in support of failed management systems. But post Brexit now, we have the opportunity to create our own systems, our own management systems, and they should be better. They should be bottom up. They should be co-management, which is, you know, directly, you know, opposite of what the commission delivered, which was top down and paternalistic. So the need for cameras to act as an enforcement tool going forward should not be so significant as it was perhaps in the past. And I think we need to remember that. And if we do remember that and accept that, that point, then I think we've got to work out, well, what is the benefit of putting cameras on board vessels? So for me, it's to reinforce what we already know. So if we assume a level of discards or fish under the minimum conservation reference size, then it's there, there to, to confirm that. We should also uh, use it for a number of other factors because we've always said that every fishing vessel is a scientific platform. And with the development of artificial intelligence, we need to focus on that so that we can draw significantly more information from the vessels than, than we currently do. Science, which some would suggest, is not what it should be, I guess is as good as it can be at the moment, but we can always improve the systems. And that would help set suitable tax and everything, which may start to prevent some of the, the choke issues uh, that were mentioned uh, earlier. But also we talk about the fishing industry and we talk about cameras as though you know the industry is one industry well it, it's not because the fishing industry in the uk is made up of a number of different sectors you've got offshore you've got inshore you've got big you've got small but you've also got sectors that lack the complexity of other sectors so we look at scallops pretty much a single fishery species you look at pelagic pretty much targeted shoaling pelagic species you look at gillnet and line you know, there is no uh, catches there under the minimum conservation reference size. And then you look at the more complex fisheries like offshore networks, like mixed white fish, whereby you can catch 20 and 30 species in a haul, and certainly not in the ratio that you need them in accordance with the opportunities that, that you have. So there's a number of complexities out there that we need to solve. But I would suggest if the industry is going to move forward in terms of remote electronic monitoring, it's got to be based on fisheries management systems that cater for it. Fisheries management systems that are seen to succeed rather than fail. Because I go back to my earlier point that you ordinarily need TVs, CCTVs, when the management system isn't working and there's anarchy prevailing. That's what essentially that was there earlier for, was to stop the anarchy element uh, of the fleet. Is there a role for them going forward? Well, essentially there is, there is. I mean, in Scotland, we've talked about, you know, putting them on vessels almost like a reference fleet to benchmark what the science is saying. What is the, the level of catches of fish under the minimum conservation reference size? You know, should we move away from a landings obligation and make it more about accountability? That takes away a threat of putting in REM. Should we use it as a reference to what we know in regards to what we're seeing? So to almost formalize the empirical information that fishermen have. So... You know, to say that cameras don't have a role in, in, in the fishing sector and all its complexities across all the sort of, you know, different sections that I've said would be wrong. Do we have to work out the reason why we're implementing it? And do we need to deliver the fisheries management systems that allow it to coexist with the industry? Because what we don't want to do is impose a system that puts extreme financial pressure on an industry because fisheries management hasn't followed through. And I get back to this point that it's about accountability rather than landing fish, uh, all fish to market. And if we can crystallize that accountability and the formality of that, then we do have a direction to go. But it's about, it's about direction of travel and it's about speed of travel. And I think along with the government, we've got to accept 
We know the direction. We just now need to work out the speed. And I'll leave it at that, David, if it's okay. Thank yeah, you. no, that's brilliant, Mike. And uh, yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. And I really, you know, that that's that's needed to be said, absolutely. Um, and it, it goes without saying, you know, um, you know, fishermen who've had cameras, you know, we do forget that they're on board the boat, but the majority of fishermen haven't had cameras yet. And it is a huge ask of the industry to go down this road. And like Mike said, you know, you've really got to consult the industry all the way and it's really got to be completely co-management in a way that we've never achieved before uh, and outside of the cfp that can be achieved so thank you thank you mike that's that's brilliant um, um okay so what i was going to do next was going to move over to a, a brief uh summary from defra from why this policy is is being put through uh, and then we we're going to hear briefly from cfas at tom catchwell uh, just the scientific uh, aspect uh, from them. So if I can leave it to you, Eleanor, um, if you want to briefly say a few words. Yeah, sure. And um, yeah, I mean, thank you for the opportunity to speak and um, thank you for everyone who has um, just shared their experiences. Um, just to quickly introduce myself and the DEFRA team. So it's me, uh, Imogen Sessford and Claire Dyer. We've all been working on developing a REM policy for DEFRA. Uh, we'll put our contact details into the chat in case anybody wants to follow up with us afterwards. Um, and I think as you know, many, many people on the call will be aware, we've been developing a REM policy for England. We're hoping to test that by consultation over the coming months. Um, you know, there's lots of really interesting projects using REM already out there, things that have happened in the past, th things that are ongoing. I think where our role is at the moment is in kind of shaping the approach to long-term implementation and thinking about that. And so just kind of really briefly, I thought it might be helpful to outline you know, some of the key principles that we're working to in doing that. Um, and, you know, it, it's been encouraging to hear people talking today because hopefully you know, they reflect some of the experiences that people have reported back and they are very much based on the conversations that we've been having over the last couple of years. Uh, but, you know, the kind of the first and really key one is that we see, you know, REM as a tool and not a solution to fisheries management issues. I think that feeds kind of directly into what Mike was saying about it being part of a bigger ecosystem of changes to how we think about fisheries management. Um, and that it's really important that REM is used in a proportionate way with clear and achievable data objectives. Um, I'll be interested in maybe hearing a bit more from Mark about the best ways to go around setting those. Um, our approach to date also points towards taking an approach that is targeted. As Mike said, we've got a very, very diverse fishing industry, you know, not just in England, but around the UK. Um, and, you know, the feeling is that we should avoid a one size fits all approach and instead be looking at introducing REM to priority fisheries and thinking about how best to use this technology to meet the monitoring needs of those fisheries and then feed that information back into fisheries management systems. The, the feedback that we've had also points towards taking a phased approach. So working with early adopters initially to build our understanding of how REM can be implemented effectively and then looking at introducing a mandatory phase later to ensure a level playing field and, you know, I think finally, it's, it's almost that last point you made, Dave, about, um, you know, it's really important to acknowledge that introducing REM more widely is going to take time and that this needs to be done in dialogue with both the fishing industry and other stakeholders in order to fully understand the, the challenges that implementation poses, but also to realise the benefits that this technology can offer, including you know, in thinking about how we're looking at changing fisheries management and how we can ensure that the, the information that we're gathering really is feeding into and delivering for the science. Um, and speaking to science about science, I might also hand over to a couple of colleagues from CFAS who are on the call um, and they can maybe sort of outline what's happening on their side. Yeah, please Tom, if you could uh, brief, briefly uh, CFAS involvement, please. Sorry. Thank you, Dave, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's very nice to see you. I'm Tom Catchpole from CFAS, and um, my role at CFAS is having sort of oversight of a range of applied fishery science programs, uh, including those uh, using REM. 
Uh, at CFAS, we've been looking at REM and using REM in projects for more than 10 years. Um, and some of our current activities include uh, a small continuous monitoring program uh, in the Celtic Sea, working with um, a few otter trawlers, including Dave. Um, and uh, the, the, the principal um, objective of that is to inform on the challenges of, of mixed fisheries, where we're, uh, there's catches of healthy stocks alongside uh, depleted stocks. Um, another key area of activity is um, through the Clean Catch project, where we're combining uh, REM data and um, skippers data um, on incidental catches of sensitive species um, and looking at um, um, testing mitigation measures and assessing their performance using REM. So as Alan was saying, we, we really see REM as a, as a data collection tool and we apply it where we think that that is the best way to answer the questions and, and generate the evidence that we're looking for. Um, it's potentially a very powerful tool um, and can be used to improve our data collection and therefore improve our evidence-based advice, which uh, goes to fisheries managers and um, strengthen the decisions made. Thanks. Thanks, Tom. Um, and um, yeah, thanks to all the speakers for, for um, speaking. It was um, really great presentations. And it's given us, well, we've really furthered the journey, I think, today. And I've, I've learned a lot. It, 